Hi, Lee. How you doing? I'm doing well. Sounds like you're doing well, too. Recently, anyway. Rachel Maddow, as a matter yeah. of fact. And that was a wonderful, wonderful session, I think. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah. I'm looking forward to this. And uh, my role, as I understand it, is one to introduce you. Now, I think you need almost no introduction. It's two to give you this luminary prize. And then finally, it's to go on and start asking questions about the fascinating life you've led both before and after COVID. So I think this is this is going to be fun. Good. Look forward to it. So let me let me talk just a little bit about uh, your background, Tony. You're now director of the NIAID, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease Institute at NIH. You cover a broad spectrum of immunologic related diseases and, and you have a budget this year, I understand, of $6.1 billion. So you have the ability to make things happen in an exciting sort of way. You're, uh, you have actually advised seven different presidents, as I understand it now, quite a remarkable accomplishment. You've been longtime chief of the lab of uh, uh, immune regulation and made fundamental contributions in, in that area. And of, of course, you have made a very uh, distinguished set of awards uh, beyond the one we're gonna give you today, including the National Medal of Science, the Corber Medal of uh, the Association of American Physicians, Alaska Award, uh, uh, National Medal of Science, and on and on. So it's been a really illustrious uh, career. And, and finally, you're a member of the National Academy of Medicine and of Science, as well as the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophic Society. So that's probably a good thing for some of the questions that are going to be coming up today and everything. But, you know, one of the facts I found most interesting, and, and we do share this, is that you were uh, captain and head of your basketball team back in high school in 1958. Correct. So I played quarterback at Shelby High School back in 1956 and before. So Anyway, it prepared you for a uh, leadership role, clearly, and that's, uh, that's what the Luminary Award is all about. So let me present that to you now. The Lumini Award, Luminary Award uh, recognizes contributions of prominent figures who have accelerated personal medicine to the clinic. And I think that describes you very well. And I love a quote from you, which said, quote, uh, my whole life professionally has been fighting from the very earliest years, HIV, influenza, Ebola, Zola, or whatever. This is what I do. And in fact, this is exactly why you're being uh, given this award. And I think you have done utterly stellar service in the past year with COVID in uh, dealing with the infection and other issues as well throughout. And I think you've done it with grace and with humility, and, uh, but a firm commitment to the science. And I think that's earned you enormous uh, gratitude, recognition, and, uh, and it, it was obviously an enormous accomplishment. So I think uh, with that, I'd like to award you the Luminary Award, which is, I think you already have now. So I'd love to be able to reach out and shake your hand, but it isn't, it isn't going to be possible. Right. Well, so, thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. I really appreciate it. It's really a great honor to receive this, but particularly from you, uh, a scientist of such extraordinary accomplishments. I, I couldn't help but remember, you probably forgot but when I was a first year clinical associate, that was 1968, 52 years ago, 
when I came in in John Johnson's laboratory, there was a journal club, which was you, Henry Metzger, John Fahey, John Johnson, and you invite little old me, who was a first year fellow, to join with these big superstars at the NIH. It was one of the most important and exciting experiences that I had as a young investigator. So I'll never forget that. How wonderful. I mean, you know what was really fabulous about NIH at that time, partly because of the Vietnam War, we had all of the people who were going to be up later go on to be leaders in American medicine. And it was a wonderful mixing ground and a chance to meet uh, people like yourself and so forth. So uh, it was an exciting time. I think we have to think about making NIH more exciting. And I've been talking recently with people that, that do have that in mind. But let's, uh, let's uh, turn to the questions now. Okay. So I'll start with a general question, Tony. We'll get into specifics and I'll come back to some general questions. And, and the general question is the year long or so COVID experience has been an enormous uh, challenge for contemporary medicine. And do you see benefits coming out of all that has happened with COVID with regard to 21st century medicine and what it's going to be? Yeah. Well, a couple of things come to mind, at least some are in the arena of public health and some are in the arena of what you and I think classically of as science. And I think what one of the things that's so clear, uh, specifically in infectious diseases, is how we showed that the investment in vaccine platform technologies together with prototype pathogen studies where you can extrapolate within families of microbes, how we did something within the context of a horrible pandemic of historic proportions to go from the availability of a sequence on a database of a brand new virus to having a phase one, two, three clinical trial and have a vaccine that's highly efficacious go into the arms of individuals in about 11 months. You know, when you and I were at the NIH together, this would have been unimaginable that we ever would have been able to do that. And I think the world needs to appreciate how the fundamental basic research that so many people do, that people may not be able to relate at the point that they are doing the research to any given intervention, have to realize now that people that were playing around with the concept of an mRNA vaccine, the people who were talking about how the conformation of a molecule that you would determine by cryo-electron microscopy might be the solution to the pre-fusion conformation that has led to a highly immunogenic spike protein for a vaccine that's now 95% effective. I think to me, that's how this year has done something about bridging what people thought was a gap between fundamental basic research and applied research. So to me, that's such a startling example of that. Yep, I, I, I agree. Do you see a path forward to really prevent another pandemic of this magnitude when we get hit with something else in the future? Yeah. Well. You know, I, I can tell you that, uh, Lee, if we, if we do lessons learned and have some degree of corporate memory, we should be able to, you know, we've always said, you'll never prevent the emergence of a new microbe, but you can prevent that emergence from becoming a pandemic. Or you would have in place the capabilities of responding to it. And I think that a lesson learned now is that this is the third pandemic of a coronavirus. Go back a few years, SARS-CoV, the first SARS was in 2002. Prior to that, coronaviruses were insignificant common cold viruses that essentially uh, accounted for maybe 15 to 30% 
of all the common colds that we repetitively get. Now that it's clear, given the animal reservoirs, that these will be with us, they're in bats all over the world, that the time has come to develop what you would be referring to as a universal coronavirus vaccine. And that's not gonna be very difficult given our technologies. Even now, as we're speaking, we have a very, very efficacious vaccine, 94 to 95%. Yet, as you could have predicted, knowing immunology the way you do, that pressure of the immune system on circulating isolates, now we have isolates in the UK, which are different, much more transmissible. And now the Brits have shown it's a bit more lethal, but a really troublesome set of mutants that have now have a new lineage in the Republic of South Africa that have diminished somewhat the efficacy of vaccines. Thank goodness it's still within the framework of efficacy, but it has brought it down a bit. We should now with our technologies not have to worry about that. We should have a vaccine as well as universally applicable antivirals that we could use for the next outbreak. And I would be really disappointed if when this is over, we don't put together a bit of a commission and codify the things we need to do, as opposed to saying, well, we got through that, now let's worry about the next problem. Do you want to explain briefly the difference between the classic vaccine, which takes a protein like the spike protein and uses it as an antigen, and the RNA approach to things? Because it seems to me that's what opens up fundamentally the opportunity for very rapid modification of vaccines yep. uh, and so forth. Yeah, so there are three platforms that are now being actively pursued for COVID-19. One is the one that Lee mentioned, which is mRNA, in which you can very easily pull out a sequence, in this case, an RNA that would code for a particular protein in a particular conformation and stick it into your RNA, your mRNA. If you need to change it, it's really simple. You just pull out one and you stick in the other. It's kind of a pull and plug and stick it in. Whereas the standard way where you develop the protein and you have a protein and give it together with an adjuvant, you would have to develop an entirely new program, uh, excuse me, protein to be your immunogen. Whereas here, all you need to do is switch sequences. So the idea that you can do that with an mRNA, not only is good for the flexibility with regard to COVID-19, but it also is gonna have us go back, Lee, and take a look at some of the vaccines that have been very problematic, HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, and even some of the cancer vaccines that we talk about. I think that's gonna open up an entirely new arena of vaccinology for multiple disciplines. And you think that will be true because it will be easy to identify on each of those pathogen sites that could be targets for immunogenesis? Yeah, you know, absolutely. In fact, that's exactly the work that uh, Barney Graham had done at the Vaccine Research Center here. You know, we had been working with RSV and determined, you know, on some structural biological collaboration that he'd been doing with HIV researchers who were looking at the conformation of the stabilized trimer of the HIV envelope and found that the pre-fusion conformation of the F protein of, of the uh, uh, respiratory syzygial virus was much more immunogenic. The trouble is it was very unstable. So it flopped around. And if you wanted to use it as an immunogen, what you, you never knew when you injected it, what it was gonna be 15 minutes later. Yeah. Yeah. So what he did is he made a couple of, uh, it took two and a half years to do it. <laughs> it sounds easy, but it wasn't to get the right mutations to stabilize it in the pre-fusion form. And then as soon as a uh, coronavirus came along, he immediately adapted that technology showing that the pre-fusion conformation of the spike protein of coronavirus needed to be stabilized. He found the mutations, he did it. And now all of the vaccines that are using the spike imidogen are using that pre-fusion conformation. 
So again, another example of what I said a few minutes ago, how fundamental basic science in one area just explodes into another area in a practical way. Absolutely. So, so let me ask you a hypothetical question, Tony. With cancer, uh, it, people have long sought vaccines that could, could protect. And I think pretty uniformly that's been unsuccessful. What about the possibility with cancer, you could analyze the tumor and identify the key variants and actually make an RNA virus vaccine to that. Would that be a way of preventing metastases after you'd had the initial treatment that cleared things out or, or something similar? Do you see those as exciting possibilities? Uh, well, I see them as exciting possibilities. And there are a lot of other people too. That do too. They, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, no sooner did it become clear that mRNA was really, really good when it came to the efficacy that people who think well beyond a given infectious disease were all light bulbs were going up and people were jumping all over it. So I think you're gonna see a lot of what you're suggestingly right now. So a question on the vaccines, once you get, well, let me ask you first, if you just have one shot and your state decides to spread the vaccine around and that's all you get for a while, how good is that protection going to be? Do we have any sense of that, Tony? Yeah, we do, but uh, different platforms are differently. So the, the Moderna mRNA and the Pfizer RNA, the studies that were done with a lot of people, 30,000 people in the trial for Moderna, 44,000 people in the trial with Pfizer, that the optimum response, if you give a prime right around starting from day 10 through day 27, you get about a 50% protection whose durability is modest to minimum. When you boost on day 21 with Pfizer and day 28 with Moderna, right around 14 days, 10 to 14 days later, you get a tenfold increase in neutralizing antibody that's durable for at least, well, I say at least six months, but it may be a few years for all we know. We've only documented it for six months. When you use a human ad 26 vector with the insert being the same spike protein uh, 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 genetic sequence, you can get a good response like 14 days after the prime and you don't need a boost. Now, J&J, which is the company out of Janssen who's doing uh, the, the uh, ad 26, are gonna also do a study with a prime and a boost. But the one that they're testing now, and we should get the results actually in the next several days to a week, the one that they've tested in the USA, in South Africa and in Brazil is a single shot vaccine, which is really very good. It has less stringent cold chain requirements and it's a single shot. So it's very nicely adapted to developing world. Oh, that sounds, that sounds really exciting. Once you have the immunity, how long is it going to last? <laughs> that is well, a key question, isn't it? No, no, it's a key question, Lee. And I have to be totally honest and modest. I don't know. I really don't know. But one of the things that is, I would say a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say disturbing, but enough for us to be, to be careful about is that if you look at the common cold coronaviruses, there are four of them that account for about 15 to 30% of all the common colds we get every year. The immunity to that does not last very long because people get infected, reinfected with the identical, genomically identical virus, which means that at least, at least for the common cold virus, protection doesn't last that long. That may be, Lee, because it's an upper respiratory and doesn't become systemic. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the thing that makes me less concerned about it. When you get vaccinated, you get a systemic response. 
not just an open uh, upper airway response. So right now, what we're gonna have to do is just follow it. The studies go out for two years. So we're gonna know, is it one year that it's the duration, two or more? But right now we don't know what the duration is. I suspect strongly that it's gonna be a longer duration than what you get with the common cold virus. It, what is the possibility we could eliminate this viral infection as opposed to the possibility it'll be like the cold virus year after year, you'll have to make a vaccine and at least old people will have to take shots. Yeah, I think that's gonna de be dependent on something that's always been a problem. And that is getting a substantial proportion of the world vaccinated. I mean, we figured out, and it was an estimate, I think it's correct, but you know, I'm not sure, that if we get 70 to 85% of the country of the United States vaccinated with an anti-COVID-19 vaccine, that we will develop a degree of herd immunity that the virus itself really won't have any place to go because there'll be very few susceptible hosts in the population. And those that would be susceptible would be protected by the herd effect of the fact that the overwhelming majority of people are vaccinated. But you're not gonna crush it, Lee, the way we did with smallpox and the way we did with yeah. polio, unless you get a multi-year global vaccination campaign going. Yeah. So that's yeah. another example of why you've got to get many companies involved to make a vaccine that does not have cold chain requirements that you can give cheaply and easily throughout the world. Yeah, I, I agree. Now, I'd like to return again to this question of the variants that have arisen and how effective the protection is going to be against those. I read just in the paper this morning that with the Moderna vaccine, it looked like the antibodies that were produced were uh, six times less effective against the variant than they were against the initial infecting agent. And what, are your, what are your thoughts about that? Well, okay, so it, there, there are two, at least two, and maybe more, uh, lineages uh, that have multiple mutants, mutations that we're concerned about. The one is in the UK. Uh, that apparently has minimal, minimum negative effect on the efficacy of the vaccine-induced antibodies, either for the monoclonal antibodies or for vaccine. It does have an increase in transmissibility, and most recently the Brits have shown that it might increase uh, lethality a bit. The thing that's of concern is what you mentioned, is the South African lineage, the 135. Uh, what that is, is as you said, about five or four to six times diminution. The, 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 the good news, if you wanna call it good news, is that the cushion of efficacy for the vaccines against the South African mutant is high enough that even with a diminution of four to six fold, you're still within the protective range. So it's, you know, we're still protecting with the vaccine, but whenever you see something that could diminish by five to six fold, you got to really be on it because even a little bit more evolution, Lee, as you well know, yep. and then yep. you're right over the, you're over the limit and you're in trouble. Yep. For that reason, what the companies are doing, certainly Moderna is doing it, is already starting to make variants with a booster, getting the mRNA and sticking the insert that codes for the RSA, the Republic of South Africa mutant, right. And, right. and start to make pilot lots of that right now to test for safety and immunogenicity. I mean, would a strategy be to mix together vaccines that covered several types so you'd have a broader spectrum of protection or would yeah. that diminish the immune responsiveness to any one of the types? I don't think so, Lee. I think that what you said is exactly where we should go. You should make a bivalent or a trivalent vaccine. Yeah. Just yeah. the way we do with, pneumoc with uh, pneumococcal pneumonia. Yeah, now I think that could be very powerful. So another question, Tony. It, we only talk about antibodies when we talk about vaccines. What's happening with T-cell immunity? It seems to me 
that is another area that could be very powerful if, if appropriately activated. Yeah, and we know we activate it. Uh, we don't know exactly because as you well know, it's so easy to measure antibody titers and get a correlative immunity. It's more difficult and cumbersome to take a look at a whole variety of T cells, CD4 and CD8 responses. But there's no doubt that these vaccines do induce uh, 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 immunogen specific CD4 and CD8 cells. And we know that. What we don't know is what the ultimate role is. It's got to have a role. We know that from so many other. I agree. Things. I mean, I, I can't agree. imagine it doesn't have an important role. Yes. I think one of the opportunities that comes up is there are new single cell technologies that really may let us sample very easily from individual patients. They're white blood cells and say, this is, this is where you are. Right. So, I mean, I think some of the technologies are really going to change things in major ways. Yeah, yeah, you know, um... Uh, Shane Crotty and Alex Sete at uh, La Jolla are, are doing that full time now. So they're, and they're not the only yeah. lab. There's a lot of other labs that are looking at that. So, so uh, Tony, I think what would be useful is could you give us a breakdown of the therapies that you think have been most effective in dealing with COVID to the extent we know them? Because in the popular press, that has not been discussed very much. And we've heard hydroxychloroquine, we've heard a lot about that on both sides. But what about what about the other ones, the anti-IL-6s, the, the antivirals? Uh, and we have good examples of where they're being used. I'm just wondering how effective they are. You know, we don't have any knockout punches like we have with the triple combination for HIV that when you give, you can essentially bring a viral load down to below detectable level to the point where you not only lead a normal life, but you don't transmit to anybody else because it's a chronic infection. It's, it's quite different. You know, HIV, you drop the virus down and everything else gets better. Here with, with COVID-19, there are so many secondary hyper-inflammatory, aberrant inflammatory responses that you see the mechanisms of which, Lee, we still are not quite sure of how you can get an aberrant triggering of an immune response. But in that context, as simple as it sounds, the treatment that has definitively shown to be the best is in hospitalized patients on ventilators or requiring high flow oxygen, dexamethasone, six milligrams a day for 10 days decreases the 28 day mortality significantly. Then you get to others that you were referring to and there's variable results. When it's done in a randomized placebo controlled trial, generally doesn't show a good effect. When you have observational and other studies, things that block inflammation, whatever they are, IL-6, IL-6 receptors, things that are blocking jack kinases and all the kinds of things that are downstream from, they seem to have an impact. The thing that we really need, Lee, is we need drugs that can be given early on to prevent someone from advancing as opposed to treating them once they've advanced. You have right. monoclonal antibodies that have got emergency use authorization. The trouble is because they're required to be given intravenously, you tend to treat later than you should. If we had the logistics of an infusion center that if you got COVID and you were getting symptomatic, you could go in, get an infusion of either gamma globulin or convalescent plasma or antibody that's a monoclonal antibody, the results would probably be more striking right now. It's Definitely. very interesting. They work only for people who don't have a good antibody response of their own. If you develop a good antibody response, convalescent plasma doesn't work at all because you already have your antibody response. So right. you have convalescent right. plasma, monoclonal antibody, and now what we're really trying to do is make a major investment in direct acting antivirals, some of the enzyme inhibitors of the replication cycle. You know, I was really shocked, I guess, to find Trump seem to recover so effectively from COVID. 
So did he get all the possible treatments that one can get? Was that the reason his response was so effective or, or do you know? <laughs> <laughs> so he got remdesivir and monoclonal antibody from Regeneron, okay? And he claims that it was like magical medicine. It made him all better. The only trouble, Lee, is that N equals one. <laughs> and I know. He, and he is the one. <laughs> so it could have been just as easy that he was going to resolve his illness anyway, even without the antibody. But when you speak to him, which I did when he was in the hospital, he swore that it was the antibody that made him better. Wow. So, and that gets us then to the whole issue of comorbidities. And you know, a question I've had, certainly comorbidities increase risk. I, I mean, that, that's clearly shown. Does aging alone increase risk, even if you're in good health? Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering which comorbidities are the most dangerous to deal with. So any insights you have would be interesting. Yeah, you know, certainly age alone, uh, Lee, with all other things being equal, a 75, 80-year-old, otherwise healthy, elderly person by the definition of elderly. Given the fact that when you measure immune competence in a person, and you know that as well as anybody in the world, it is not as good as a healthy 25-year-old. So That's if you look true. purely on the basis of the various variables, age alone is an individual factor. Then you add on to that diabetes, obesity, chronic lung disease, chronic kidney disease, it is noteworthy that prominent among these is obesity, which is really interesting. So morbid obesity is a very, very high risk for serious disease and even mortality. That gets us to the interesting situation of the disparities of health in the country, because brown and black people people who are of the minority group, not only do they have a greater chance of getting infected on the basis of the jobs they generally have out in the community, not being able to get behind the computer, they get more exposure. But when they do get infected, because of the higher degree of hypertension, diabetes, uh, obesity, and chronic lung disease in the African-American and to some extent the Latinx population, that's the reason why the hospitalizations are multifold greater in that group and the deaths are about two to three times greater. Do we have any idea why that is? Is that uh, a, a less effective capacity for presenting antigen because they have different uh, antigen presenting molecules and so forth? Or is there any clue whatsoever? There's no clue whatsoever. You know, You know, you could get more generic and say, well, People with diabetes don't fight infection as well as those who don't have diabetes. I, I guess you could make that extrapolation. The thing about obesity, I think, is a mechanical issue because we have known, interestingly, that when people are having respiratory issues with COVID-19, if you turn them over and prone them, it, it's like better than putting them on a respirator in some respects. I mean, it's much, much easier likely for the diaphragmatic, diaphragmatic movement. So that's the same thing, that when you're obese, you have a real difficulty in the free flow of the diaphragm moving up and down. So I think it more is a mechanical issue when it comes to uh, obesity, but more of a metabolic issue when you get to diabetes. I see. What, what about the racial disparities too? I mean, clearly comorbidities are a part of that, but is there fundamentally more than that, do you think, no. Tony? There is no evidence, Lee. It's an obvious good question. There's no evidence that race in and of itself makes a difference. Because thus far, we could not figure anything out. Because as you know, the difference uh, genomically, one race to another is, is, is pretty minuscule. Small. Yeah. <laughs> it's minuscule. <Yeah. laughs> so w w what it is, we don't know. But certainly, the, certainly the, the, the comorbidities are association with the social determinants of health. And when you look at that, look at minority populations and look at the things that they are exposed to or not from youth, 
not good medical care, not good healthy diets, all of those things create those comorbidities that don't have to invoke race, except in the context of the association with poor economic status that allows you to have these social determinants of health. Yeah. So, so let me ask you about uh, diagnostics. Uh, it seems to me one of the keystones of being able to deal with a pandemic from day one has been lots of assays to determine whether individuals did or did not have COVID-19. And I, I think even more so now that we're going into second or third waves or whatever we call these things, and, and especially with the variants where we'd like to look at those. I remember uh, we started a observational clinical trial at ISB using very deep immune phenotyping, which has had, uh, this was headed up by uh, Jim, Jim Heath, and they've had really fascinating kinds of results. But I argued that I thought from day one, we should be doing every viral genome sequence so we could see just how this whole thing was evolving because we knew it would evolve for sure. And it, it seemed that that wasn't something pushed in the US at all. Do you, do you have any sense of why that might not yeah, have been? I, and of course, now we're in a real spot because we can't begin to do what we should be doing. Yeah. That is, um, I think, a uh, somewhat inexcusable deficiency that we've had. I mean, it, the Brits, as you probably know, do many, many, many fold more sequence surveillance than we do. We really have got to build that up. We now are much more doing that where the NIH is partnering with the CDC. It's still the major responsibility is the CDC. But one of the things we have in this country that they don't have elsewhere is that we have this independent groups. You got the Broad doing what they do. You got Illumina doing what they do. You got the NIH doing what we do. Instead of having everything going into one database, it's, it, yeah. you have to go searching around for it. Well, the CDC has put together um, a, a, a consortium called SPHERES S-P-H-E-R-E-S, -E I keep forgetting what it stands for, but what it is, is to really get all of the different centers that are collecting genomic surveillance data and streaming it into one accessible database so that we can do much more than we're doing. But you're absolutely right. And the reason it comes back to bite us, Lee, is because people say, do we have the lineage that's South Africa in the United States? And we know it's not dominant but we don't know it's here or not because we haven't yeah. done enough yeah. comprehensive sequencing to know if it's here or not. And right. that's the problem. We got to do that really quickly. I agree. I think that's really important. So let me ask you about another aspect of, uh, of COVID-19 that has really intrigued me. And that is uh, something that's come to be called the long haulers. These are individuals that go through their treatment, their release, their uh, by, by diagnostic test, COVID-19 negative, but they end up having consequences from the infection that persist for extended periods of time. And they can be cardiovascular, they can be neurologic, they can be GI, they can be uh, pulmonary. Um, and I mean, what one of the things I'm really struck with is those long haulers that have neurologic deficiencies, it reminds me in some ways of chronic Lyme disease. And that again is an infection that starts with a, 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 a microbe type uh, organism, spirulia organism, and it maintains itself long time. And I wonder if that's what's happening with these long haulers that even if you don't have intact genomes, you might have fragments that can produce proteins to give you immune responses. You know, that is conceivable, Lee. Um, first of all, it, it, for the audience, A, it's a real phenomenon. I mean, it, if you look at people who have some sort of symptoms, you know, you have 
20 plus million people in the United States infected, a small proportion of them go on to develop symptomatic and serious symptomatic disease. But of those who have symptomatic disease, even if it's not requiring hospitalizations, have exactly what you're describing. After they apparently clear the virus as a replication competent virus, they are PCR completely negative, done, that's it. Then what you do is you see variable and the percentage goes anywhere from a few to 15, 20, 25%. They have variable degrees of symptomatology that seems to be somewhat consistent. Profound fatigue, number one, muscle aches, temperature dysregulation suggesting dysautonomia, neurological issues, and what people are referring to as brain fog, an inability to concentrate or focus. They just can't read something. They can't look at a computer screen. They have real difficulty. And you're absolutely right. It smacks clinically. It may be mechanistically different, but it smacks clinically of Lyme disease or the, the post-Lyme persistent symptoms, as well as myalgic encephalitis chronic fatigue syndrome. Right, now, absolutely. People get upset when you say that. I'm not saying that it is myalgic encephalitis, but the constellation of symptoms that are unexplainable yeah. are quite similar, yeah. quite similar. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think the way forward in dealing with this is going to be, Tony? Well, I think what we need to do is to get cohorts, large cohorts, find out some fundamentals, Lee. A, what is the prevalence of this? What, is it 2% of symptomatic people, 10%, 15%, 20%? Then we've got to do, as you know better than anybody in the world, we've got to do some deep phenotyping on them. We've yeah. got to find out everything about them. What are their inflammatory markers? Do they have any? What are, you know, single cell expressions, you know, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of genomic expression at the very sensitive single cell level? That's what we've got to see. I mean, things that we haven't done, we've just looked at them clinically. We haven't done the kinds of sophisticated analyses. We have a study right now, we, we, we did a workshop on December the 3rd, December the 4th, trying to get people from throughout the country to have ideas about that. We're gonna ask the Congress for significant resources to utilize some of the cohorts that we've put together for other diseases. The all of us, you know, a Framingham type approach to take a look at that to see what is the commonalities there. Are there any mechanisms of pathogenesis that we can determine? That's gonna be fascinating. The observational trial we did actually looked at 5,000 single cell analyses from each blood draw uh, for each patient. And with deep transcriptome analysis and more recently epigenetic analysis, you can define what every single cell is and its activation state and because we looked at different time points, you can see trajectories of the disease, the drug response, the patient response, and so forth. So I think these single cell analyses are really going to be transformational in the future. And that's, that's what we mean by deep phenotyping. Right. And we are going to try and do long haulers in exactly the same way. But uh, so I, I think I think we're just going to learn a tremendous amount about this, uh, this disease, there's no question. Right. How do you, do you have a clear idea of what's going to happen with COVID? And I guess the key answer is, can we get things under control or not? But I'd love to, where are we going in the future? Well, the first thing we've got to do right now is to, you know, globally we've got to do it, but let's stick with the United States first, is we've got to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible to shut off these ridiculous numbers of, you know, 100 to 200 to 300,000 people getting infected 
every day. We've got to shut that off. And I think vaccine is the only way to do it. We're going to get mutants. We're going to get evolution. We certainly are going to get variants and the lineages are going to change. We've got to be able to anticipate that and wind up with what we mentioned before is a multivalent vaccine that would cover that all. We, we've, got to, we've got to crush this, Lee, the way we did with other pandemic infections like polio and smallpox, measles and things like that. And do you think we have a reasonable chance of doing that? I Tony? do, I do, I do. But you know, what we have to do is the world has to pull together. We have to have, you know, a, a commitment of cooperation, collaboration and solidarity so that everybody in the world can have access to vaccines. We've got to do what we did with polio. We can't just say the rich countries are going to be the ones that are going to get vaccinated because as long as you have the virus circulating in countries that have high population and low health care and low accessibility to vaccines, the virus is going to continue to evolve. We think, we don't know, but we think that one of the reasons for the evolution of the mutant that's seen in South Africa now is that a substantial double digit proportion of the population is infected with HIV. And if you get somebody infected and they don't clear the virus as rapidly and you give the virus an extra few days to replicate in a host that's not clearing it, the immunological pressure in that host is gonna pressure the virus to mutate. Right. So it is entirely conceivable that when you have a highly suppressed population like you do in South Africa with people who have <coughs> immune suppression related to HIV, that could be one of the mechanisms where the immune system essentially puts pressure on the virus to mutate. So, so let me ask you an interesting question, Tony. If back in February, COVID came along and we had an administration that believed in science, what should we have done? Well, I mean, there are a lot of things that we should have done. Um, Lee, like I discussed in the, my interview in the, in the New York Times, I, I, don't, I don't take any pleasure out of having to publicly contradict or, or uh, show the, the incorrectness of statements or policies that an administration might make. But I, I, I had to do that early on because what we saw so much of was policy and discussions by anecdote as opposed to science. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was trying to make the point, you know, as you had mentioned that we were joking, you know, N equals one is not a scientific process. It's an observation that is not backed up until you do a clinical trial. So we were having people, and we didn't even know who they were, friends or acquaintances who would phone in, access to the highest office in the land, say, hey, I just took this and I got better. Then all of a sudden, I, wow, that must work. So that, that doesn't work when you're dealing with. And also, I think the, the fact, and this is no individual's fault, it's just the nature of our country, Lee, that to have a serious historic outbreak occur when there's extraordinary divisiveness in society, and an outbreak of this historic proportion, if it requires anything, it requires unity and people pulling together because we're all in this together. When you add the divisiveness, the political divisiveness that occurs where wearing a mask or not becomes a political statement, that is antithetical to how you should be responding to a public health crisis. And that's Boy. why we are where we are. That's why we, now, now let's, let's, but let me go back to my question and say, let's suppose Biden is president in February and we're facing what we face. What could we have done then, you think that would have, I mean, I mean, there are a lot of obvious things, but I'm just curious what you think would have been the most important things to do? Well, there were several of them. One is to admit, you know, as I've said publicly, 
the only way that you were going to fix a problem is when you own the problem. So if you have denial as to the existence or the seriousness of a problem, you'll never fix it. So yeah. one of the things that didn't occur was there was many respects, as you know, I mean, it's public knowledge now. I would be saying we're in trouble. We need to double down. These are serious situations. And then you'd get a statement from above that would say, oh, it's going to go away like magic. You know, it, it, it's not. It's not going to go away spontaneously. And I think one of the things we have now, it doesn't mean we wouldn't have been hurt badly because every country in the world really has gotten hurt badly. So I don't think it would be a magical turning around with a different administration, but it would have been different. Because, you know, one of the things that that we're addressing now that I always found throughout the months that we went through was that the dissociation between the federal government and the states, the federal government shouldn't fix local problems and local should not be left on their own to do it on their own. There should be a synergy, a cooperation and a collaboration between the federal government and the states and the cities. And we didn't have that. We had such a, you know, federalism which is the form of our founding fathers, works really well under certain circumstances. But where it doesn't work well is when you have a communicable disease that's highly transmissible. Because although a state like Louisiana versus Mississippi versus Alabama versus Florida like to do things that are different depending upon the specific nature of their state. The virus doesn't know anything about the border between those states at all. So there needs to be a certain degree of commonality, of plan, of purpose in how you're going to address an outbreak. You can't have one state completely ignoring issues like mask wearing or avoiding congregate settings. And then you have another state doing something that is trying to contain the outbreak. It's an infectious disease. It's going to find the vulnerable parts in society. And then you're going to have an outbreak that just goes on and on and on. And that's unfortunately what we've had. So what's your projection about whether or not such an alliance can be forged effectively? You, you apparently had recently a call reconnecting us with WHO and so forth. I would guess they were really responsive to us coming back into the fold again. It actually, they were delighted. And that was something that was really very important uh, that we did that. But I'm more concerned uh, about within our own country, um, even though we have now an administration that admits this is a really serious problem, realizes that science is the way out of this, that we need to follow consistent public health messages like mask wearing and things like that, still, there is a degree of divisiveness in the country that I think is going to make where we want to go. You know, the question you've asked me, you know, what's going to be success? It's going to make it very, very difficult unless, and I hope, that with all of the deaths and the suffering that we've seen, that somehow that divisiveness gets put aside and we say, I know we're going to have ideological differences. That's what makes this a vibrant country. But let's not be so divisive that we're letting a viral enemy win this war. I mean, that's the thing that's so discouraging. No, I agree. I mean, one of the statistics I've always thought was really striking is COVID has now killed more Americans in more or less a year than World War II did. Yep. That is just, I mean, just think about the loss that we've had in that context. And yet, I wonder whether you can meet you can meet and, and change the minds of the naysayers. I think that's going to be an enormous challenge. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, and that's the thing, if you ask me, of all the things that trouble me and cause me anxiety, it's just what you said, Lee, just what you said. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm from Montana and I remember going and I read an article about this in the New York Times or someplace this morning. I remember going <clears throat> into a coffee shop and talking with a young girl who said, it's horrible. It's doctrinaire about whether you wear the mask or, or uh, uh, 
coffee shop requires that you wear masks and people will come in and fight with me. And she said, it's so wearing. Every day I have the same people fighting. And it's how you reach across. I mean, one way you can reach across is at least if we get good science education in the schools, maybe we can start uh, with a longer term view of things. But boy, changing adults' minds is something I think it's one of the grand challenges of society. <laughs> right. A grand challenge is the right terminology, Lee. <laughs> yeah. So, so let me ask you, uh, Tony, we're, we're coming to the end of this conversation, but if you had a close family member come down with COVID, what would be your recommendation about uh, the kind of treatment that they get? Yeah. Yeah, right now, if it was someone who came down with an infection and was symptomatic and you could get them right away, I think the, the potential for monoclonal antibody, I think is probably the best thing that we could do to get something that attacks the virus early. If I found out that they were acutely ill and they were in a hospital, I would get them anti-inflammatories, either dexamethasone, um, one of the blockers of IL-6 um, yeah things like yeah. that but mostly yeah. dexamethasone you know uh-huh and do you think there's been an improvement in the treatment overall as we've learned because it seems to me the the respiratory frequency has gone down and con oh, yeah. earlier control is what how have you seen it changed yeah i mean putting aside the the actual specific medical interventions like steroid, remdesivir, IL-6 inhibitors, things like that. The experience in how to take care of this brand new, somewhat puzzling disease has allowed us to do simple things that actually have made the mortality go way down. For example, when people would begin to become in respiratory distress, we would immediately put them on a ventilator. We find out now that sometimes that's the worst thing, worst thing you, you can, can do, do. Yeah. right? You want to give them high flow oxygen, position them in the prone position so that move air better. And you find out that they do much better and pull out of it much easier than when you start to ventilate them. So those kinds of things that you do and better, better ICU care, you know, was the same thing, Lee, when I was taking care of, then AIDS patients, even before we knew it was HIV and before we had any drugs, even with no new interventions, you learn how to take care of really desperately ill people who are ill with a particular disease. You just get experience and you get really better at it. Do you think that there are gaps in the education of medical students with regard to infectious disease? <laughs> And, and uh, I know the answer is obvious to that, but, but what should we go about? How can we go about fixing that? Because these aren't gonna go away as I think we all agree these days. Well, I hope that there is a greater interest on the part of students and interns and residents for infectious disease. Uh, I think if anything, these outbreaks and pandemics that we are experiencing are telling us that we need to do much more in the arena of infectious diseases. So the answer to your question, even if I were not the director of the Infectious Disease Institute, I think I would have to honestly tell you that I don't think we're spending enough time on infectious diseases. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess that also relates to understanding immunity better than most medical students right. understand right. it too. Indeed. Uh, uh, yeah. So, um, are I think there I have, any? I think I have to run, uh, uh, Lee. My, my staff is telling me somebody. <laughs> I, I okay. To... <laughs> Do you want to make a final one sentence statement or two? It's been a terrific interview, Tony. Thank you very, very much. Congratulations on, on all you've endured and how effectively you come out of it. And I hope you can change the world. All right, thank you, Lee. My, my only closing statement is that it's, it's always a great pleasure to be with you and to interact with you. 
And thank you for giving me the opportunity to be with you and engage in this enjoyable and a stimulating conversation. Thank okay. you. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Lee. Take care. Take care.